Welcome to Conversations with Toy, a blogcast tackling life one episode at a time. This is the time to air out life's craziest moments. This space is all about speaking about life's hang-ups and ways in which we can leave better than when we started. Topics are all about ways we can find space to be better in life, love, mental space and health. So we are here. Um, This is a bonus episode, everyone. This is a bonus episode. And why are we here for a bonus episode? I had the elitist privilege of speaking to Miss Katrina Hall. Miss Katrina Hall is a Philadelphia based actor, director and playwright. She is going to be um, the director for uh, Phoenix Theater's newest, newest play. And I am so excited um, because one, it's going to be done, you know, online and we know how that's been, how that's been going down online, especially in how plays are being done. So the play um, will be premiering this Friday, Saturday and Sunday. It is the retelling of William Shakespeare, The Winter's Tale. So this Friday, February 19th through Sunday, the February the 21st. You will see Miss Katrina Hall and her amazing, amazing ensemble put together this amazing play. And I had the opportunity to speak with her before the show. So that's what this this episode is going to be about. And let me tell you, if you want to talk to someone, I talking to Miss Katrina was like talking to one of my favorite aunts. It was like talking to an uh, uh almost like a sister, like an older sister who just was wise. Like when you when you listen to her, listen. The Jews that are being dropped in this interview has been amazing. We're talking about forgiveness. We're talking about marriage, single, being single. We're talking about church. We're talking about it all. I mean, literally, there's really nothing that was left undone. And I really want you to just tune in, listen, and experience this for yourself. So without any further ado, thank you, Miss Katrina. I appreciate your patience. I'm so sorry. We were having no, such no, no. no worries. Brave new world. This is how we live now. Yes, this is how it goes. Mm-hmm. Well, first of oh, all, yeah. I would say thank you for accepting this invitation. And um, I'm so glad for the show. I'm going to be seeing it on Friday night. Oh, outstanding. Thank you so much. Yep, Friday night. So I will be viewing it myself. So um, thank you for this time. And I wanted to just give you this opportunity, one, to just give a brief introduction of yourself, and then we'll start talking about the show and the, what your expectations of it is and what the, you know, the audience can expect to see. Sure. Um, I am Katrina Hall. I am uh, an actor, director, and playwright, uh, born and raised here in Philadelphia, current Center City resident. Um, and I have written an adaptation of William Shakespeare's The Winter's Tale. All right. So can you go into like a general idea for people who have maybe have never, ever heard of The Winter's Tale or anything of that sort? Can you just go into like a brief description of exactly what the play is going to be about just to spark people's interest and why, you know, they should also see it? Sure. Uh, The Winter's Tale is, I think, arguably one of um, Shakespeare's lesser known plays. Mm -hmm. I think even people who um, um, have a more than baseline familiarity with Shakespeare potentially have not read it. Uh, Traditionally, it's known as one of his problem plays. Mm -hmm. Um, And as written, it's about the overarching theme is one of forgiveness and renewal and um, time healing um, in regard to, you know, maybe you've done some really terrible things, but um, if you do enough penance, you know, by your standard, right, um, all will be well, ultimately, or most will be well. Um, One of the key differences in this adaptation is I question whether or not um, forgiveness is infinite. 
Mm. Is um is everything truly forgivable? Yeah, I think that's and, very layered. Like even yeah. our everyday lives, that's a very layered conversation. I'm really personally dealing with that right now um, through therapy. Mm-hmm. You know, this level of, like you said, is it is it infinite? Like how far is there a, yeah. is there a limit to how yeah. far someone can go in whatever that they're doing? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Towards another person, towards a group of people, towards whomever. That's what I'm actually exploring too in my own personal life. Yeah, especially I think when it comes to forgiveness, and this is um, another uh, um, overt deviation from the original. This idea that women can forgive anything, in particular that we as women have this infinite capacity, you know, to just get over it. You know, because when I first read the play, <laughs> I first read the play and I read with the, um, I read with Leontes, um, our uh, our antagonist, <laughs> right, um, had done, I, I, and 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 how the the theme of the play was forgiveness, and I read what he had done, and I went, you know, <laughs> really, <laughs> you know, this right, is, is this forgivable? And you know, some people really do have this infinite capacity to do that. But I really do believe that that capacity uh, generally is attached to women. And I question the validity of that. Right. Because I think a lot of it for me, I feel like, do you think that's an expectation for women to just kind of go with the flow? We forgive, we move on. It's a circle because I was talking to a friend about that today. Or is this something that a male's perspective and generally just to bring it to like more context of just recently this week, there was a rapper that discussed you know, women, you know, forgiving particularly men and whatever transgressions, usually cheating or some type of infidelity and the thought process that women are dogged more if they are forgiving. Like if it's a known situation, like sometimes things can be private, but once it becomes everybody publicly knowing about it and the thought process that women are supposed to be more forgiving and if they don't, they're not considered to be loyal so how much, you know, does the loyalty with women, like it's always questioned. It's never questioned in my opinion. It's never really fully questioned with men. I feel like sometimes women that forgive, if men were in the same position are not as apt to do it and they're not, they're not pushed to do it more like women are. Well, I do think women in general, overall, not, not just, um, well, yeah, okay, we'll keep it specific to men. I do think we do have a tendency to forgive because um, sad as it is to say, it is safer Mm -hmm. physically for us to be forgiving because oftentimes um, in most situations, not all, it can, um, if you have a man inclined to, you know, be physical, if you challenge him and if for whatever reason you're still with him, it can keep you physically intact to just forgive. Right. But um, also, um, I think um, there's a pragmatism about women where um, even if it's not a physical thing, you could end up in terms of having a roof over your head and blah, 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 be better off Mm -hmm. to like, to just forgive it because the alternative is so much worse. Yeah, because it takes a lot. If you know, if you're in a situation where one person is more financially, if a man in this particular yeah. situation, this particular context, if a man is more well um, financially and he's exactly. providing your quote unquote lifestyle, it's like mm-hmm. okay, now if I if I don't forgive, there's a level of work that comes along with me uprooting my entire life, whether that be a single mm-hmm. life, whether that be with my children, whether whatever that may be. Now I have to do a whole slew of work. Mm-hmm. To uproot yeah, myself yeah. from the situation. It's real, and you know, you know how it is. Everyone who hasn't been tested can mm-hmm. always tell you how much better and cooler and wiser they would have been in your situation. Oh well, right. that's lovely, but that we're never going to find that out, right? Because you're right. not in the situation. But so, when you're in it, it's not as black and white as people make it want to seem. There's a lot of layers to it. Yeah. And and you end up having to take on a lot of the burden. Women end up taking a lot of the burden to get themselves it, past it. It can be um, it can be tricky. Um, well, not tricky with men, 
okay, this is, you know, a middle-aged black lady's perspective to any very young women out there who will hear me say this, do not let me jade you. Okay. (laughs) This is just coming, you know, from somebody who's over half a hundred. All right. The thing is what I've learned ultimately, um, and and I think this does connect to forgiveness, to forgiveness um, when it comes to men. If you have a choice between having a man's love, and a man's respect, mm. you got to choose the respect. Exactly. And that's where the forgiveness part for me becomes tricky because if, forg- if you forgive him, um, lots of people would mistake that for weakness. Right. It's, right. Instead of self-preservation, blah, blah, blah. And if they think you are weak, they will lose respect. And I think it's a really careful balancing act. It is. And I was talking to my husband of all people about this Mm because, you know, we were talking about like, what would be the worst case scenario for us, even in our own relationship. Mm -hmm. And in my Mm twenties, I was like, Oh no, I'll ride or die. You know, we, this whole concept of ride or die, like Mm -hmm. that's so flawed. I think it's so flawed, especially where where young women get this idea that you like, you have to roll with the punches and I'm never going to leave and I'm going to be there. Like I thought like that in my twenties, but I'm almost 40. I'll be 40 this May. And I'm like, mm, I'm not that same 20 year old woman. Exactly. That same 20 year old woman. I probably would have been very forgiving of a lot of things, but at almost 40, I don't, it doesn't look, the forgiveness does not look the same. There's that pressure on us in black women, you know, yes. to stay in, you know, you know, what, you know, a lot of us like call struggle love, you know, yeah, struggle love that. sort of situations. <laughs> and you go, why? <laughs> Listen, um, you know, at your age now, okay, in your 20s, like you said, you know, you may not have experienced this, or you know, maybe, maybe you, you had at that point. There is no loneliness, like the loneliness of being with someone and still and feeling by yourself. Alone. Yes. And I, it's a whole, that's a whole nother void. Like that's, yeah, that's a whole nother void because you're literally, just be by yourself. Right. You you feel feel the same way by yourself, but you're with somebody laying next to them, knowing that they're not, they're not Mm -hmm. as in love with you as you are. And I think too, that other question of who loves the more of the person more, which also bears to who forgives the most. If you're forgiving the most, it can be Mm -hmm. sometimes correlated with You love the hardest, the love the most. And sometimes that means you end up holding the bag of acceptance. And then that fine line of then where's the forgiveness? How far? You know, I think uh, one of the things, it's in the margins. It's it's not overt in this adaptation of Winter Tale. But um, I I think in my heart that Hermione, you know, Mm -hmm. who, you know, our heroine, um, I think she learns something that all of us, if the situation is not so great uh, mentally for you or physically, right. you, um, if you're able, you have to be able to learn to go, I love you, but so what? So right. what? I love you. So what? I love, I love you. you and that means I'm still not, I don't have to be yeah. here. And I love you, but I, I, I have to go. So this idea that just because you love someone, you have to stay. Um, I think it's inherently flawed, but I, I don't know that if I um, somehow come to myself now in my twenties, I would have understood or believed that. Even though I'm, right. you know, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you know, I know, you know. I know for myself. I, I know in my twenties, I it was not. It, it can't to resonate. love is to stay. Yes. To love is to stay, and to mm-hmm. love is again that struggle. Love is to these are this is a normal occurrence of mm-hmm. relationship this is a normal cadence mm-hmm. of how relationships work mm-hmm. but again right. <laughs> the young lady I was at 20 has ex- exclusively changed and evolved and I think exactly. once and it'll continue to evolve and I'll continue to that the worst thing to be is alone because okay. okay I'm going to tell you okay over um I have never wanted to be married I have turned down two repo- proposals Okay. Over the course of my life, the one um, that I really would have accepted to, you know, keep the peace, you know, mm-hmm. because again, I didn't see any reason to be married just because, you know, we were in right. love. But that happened in my 30s. 
and there was an irreconcilable difference that we both would have screwed up had it happened in our 20s. Okay. You know, but that's when it really settled in where it's like, just because you love someone, it doesn't automatically mean you you can't even can end up with them if you don't have, you know, all these kind of extraneous, you know, physical and mental problems. Mm-hmm. Um, that really set me. It's like, well, you know, just because I love you, you know, it's, it's, I don't want to say that it's not enough per se. Right. But it may, to be together may still not be realistic. And you I know, think a lot of that, does that, I feel like we're almost inherently almost taught that to a certain degree like and i oh, feel like i was taught that, I, like taught that from <laughs> examples like my mom or right, examples right. of like grandparents like you know and you're like well my parents were married for x amount of years but there was a level of shenanigans oh, yeah. that went along with that like and as i got older i realized that when i was younger my parents were very um up front with a lot of things and some things they just couldn't really hide like sure, as, sure. especially as i got to be come an adult they just couldn't hide it and so there are things that you kind of bring into your own self which then brings into a level of relationships that you learn that it's a learned behavior oh Oh, yeah absolutely um i don't okay i don't know how much that particular thing is true with younger women today Mm -hmm. but there's, there's definitely a lot of this ride or die stuff that you know, upsets me, you know, yes. um, it's very problematic. It's like, it's, that problematic. For, it's like that forgiveness thing too. Right. Where it kind of benefits accepting so less. Yeah. It kind of benefits the, the men mm-hmm. uh, very much. And it, it costs us so much like in the, like in the play, I, I think there's some, I think there are prices, there's some prices that are too high and between movies and um, most of us, most black folks have been raised in a Judeo-Christian, right. um, even passively, even if you didn't go to church, mm-hmm. you, you do have the remnants of that faith um, that, you know, that tells you about this infinite forgiveness that you right. are supposed to uh, be able to exhibit, you know, yeah. and I don't, I mean, I don't know, listen, if that's what it takes to be God, like I am perfectly I'm content with the idea that God is better than me. <laughs> okay. Right. You know, there are some things I'm not going to like, right. I've not arrived right. at that. Yeah, like, I've okay. had to have that even outside of marriage or anything like that. I've had yeah, to deal yeah. with that with just family, especially when because I'm your family or because I'm your elder or because mm-hmm. I'm whatever the title becomes, mm-hmm. you're supposed to just take whatever's being dished. And when I finally came to the point of realizing that I can forgive you and love you from mm-hmm. like over there, mm-hmm. I can stay over here yeah. yeah, and I can choose when I want to in- have you in my life or entangle you. It was a freedom that I can't, I can't put into words, but again, it's this, and I was raised in a church, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And so it was this whole pressure of, you know, you, in order for you to get to heaven, you have to be able to forgive no matter what. And it's like, okay, I can forgive even but the most. That's suspiciously convenient, right? right? It's convenient it's for you to continue just... doing what you do exactly. at, my, at my expense, right? And that's yeah, Especially with women. There's a weird convenience to that, you know, where, you know, your partner can do whatever, mm-hmm. but this Christian doctrine says, no, you got to, you got to forgive it. Do whatever to you, do whatever to your kids. Right. And, you know, you're supposed to just, well, no, wow, that's really convenient. For the people who listen, you know the comedian Pat Oswald. Yes. Okay. Yes. Pat Oswald has that joke about uh, the Bible and people who really, you know, take, you know, learn the wrong lessons. You right. Know? And he goes, "Listen, I'm glad you like a book. I'm glad you like a book. Okay. Right. <laughs> but maybe you should be reading some other things to expand your point of view, because what I have noticed." is oftentimes more, more, pe- more than I think people would, um, who identify as Christian would like to admit that their own personal morals mm-hmm. lots of times are superior to what is inside that book. Yes. Can you think of a circumstance, this is a little aside, but mm-hmm. can you think of a circumstance under which 
you with your personal moral code. And you know, you tell the truth because you might surprise me here. Okay. <laughs> you know, your personal moral code um, where somebody could order you to slaughter a town and you would do it. But if God tells you to do it, that tends to override mm-hmm. people's own personal moral codes. Like, you would never do this. Right. Of your own accord. But somehow, um, in, according to this book, God can command you to do something pretty heinous. But because God said it, it'll just override what you personally think is right or wrong. And right. I think that, that can be the danger of that sort of thing. It can give vi- people of great faith license to do really terrible things. Well, I'll just talk about experience where I had a situation where there was a, you know, our moral, you know, the, in, in the Bible, it talks about, oh, you know, homosexuality, for, just mm-hmm. as an example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are like, oh, no. As a person, I may be like, it's, it's not a problem. But then mm-hmm. God says this. So now I'm going to take what, what was said. Right. And right. now I'm going to shun a whole gamut of people, which is the reason why we had so right. Right. much drama and foolishness in the Black community where yeah. it comes to yeah. homosexual and trans and all that. And it, and it is, it's like, wait a minute. So you can't look past and see a person for who they are, a human. Yeah. Right. You can't express love and ex- acceptance for people to make choices for what's best for them because of this one scripture. And then take that scripture mm-hmm. to be malicious, to be mm-hmm. mean, to be inherently disrespectful mm-hmm. based upon this one thing. But like I've always said, you know, the, you got this one scripture you're using. You've negated the 99. Right. You've yes. negated your 99 yeah, for this yeah. one. You know, we there's gluttony in there. We 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 overeat. We we don't have any problems with that. We'll continue doing that, but mm-hmm. we have a problem to use this one part, and then mm-hmm. have that part then become inherently ignorant towards other people. Well, even in the play, um, um, Leontes is um, going on about in my version. He he's going on about how he knows that he's been forgiven from on high. He's completely confident of this, you know, and that kind of, again, this assurance of, Mm -hmm. you know, if if you have this certainty that's coming from above, it can blind you to, like, you know, we live here. We live here on earth, okay? This (laughs) is where we are, you know, and we have these um, human parameters that we operate within that we have to, to survive, you know, as a society, we have to operate within these, these human parameters. So when he's doing things, uh, when he's making his case about how he's been forgiven and you've come back to me because it's a sign that I've been forgiven, right. you know, and, and applying this kind of divine rationale to these real life things, um, I think it's folly. And I think it's his folly. To right. uh, among other things, you know, um, to a degree, absolutely. How do you, how do you reconcile, like when you're writing, you, you know, you're directing, you're, and all this is going on, do you, have you in the, in the cast had conversations about all these different things of forgiveness? Like, cause bringing all that in, in my opinion, especially when you're doing a part helps to elevate the part a little bit long, you know, a little bit larger than just yourself. Do you have you guys had like an open discussion about these different themes? Well, um, to the degree we've discussed it, I've discussed it mostly with uh, Isabel, who's playing Hermione, mm-hmm. uh, because she's the one expected, you know, right to forget um, in the original play. It's actually it's really interesting. Um, in the original play, when, you know, for anybody who wants to read it, I guess I don't want to spoil a right, 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 hundreds right. hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of year old play, as much as you can spoil that. Um, when Leontes and Hermione reunite, it's very interesting because she doesn't verbalize initially that she forgives them. She's silent. Mm. And that was one of the things that, you know, kind of piqued my interest a bit. It's like, well, did she? She's come back. The first words she says are to her daughter. Mm. She didn't say anything immediately to Leontes. And I went, what is she thinking? 
right. I'm thinking, oh, she's thinking, hmm, well, I'm back because um, these are the times we live in. And right. it is probably better for me to come back ultimately, even though we have been apart 16 years. But, you know, you up, you know, you updated to a more current time and, you know, now she has more options. Right. You know, and also, and again, this is um, really not what my version of the play is about. But again, it's, it's in the margins of it. I think we, as not just as women, as human beings are, and I really do think this, a lot of this comes from, from movies because they, they can wreck you um, because they really do inform a lot of us what our expectation of love right. is supposed to be. This idea that um, the person that you love, marry whoever, has to fulfill your every need emotionally. This idea mm -hmm. that you can't go outside of that. Right. Listen, if I, if I have a man and he is, you know, all kinds of wonderful, but, you know, he's really not down to talk about theater. Right. Now, if I think that he's supposed to, you know, no, but we're together. So we're supposed to have, you know, be like-minded all the time. You know, I, I could potentially sabotage that relationship out of my right. frustration. How about this? How about all these theater friends you have? You discuss that with them, okay? Instead right. of thinking that he has to literally be your everything. So, we, you know, we have this idea that, um, and, and that's kind of a, a, an admittedly trivial example. Right. But this idea. But that's still, that love. there's a large layer with that too. Yeah. Because a lot of people is, again, I when I came in, again, my 20s. Yeah. And the thought process of, um, hold on one second. Okay, I apologize for that. So this large thought process, again, I know from myself, I can only talk for myself, when being in your 20s and you feel like this, this man fills in the gap, this thought process of, like you said, being equally yoked and having this man complete you, this whole complete mm -hmm. you conversation that people bring up in weddings, you complete me. Instead of being one complete human who unites with another complete human mm -hmm. again, and people don't even realize again, that also means dealing with the trauma and things that you brought into the situation. Cause we don't oh. do, we don't deal with that at all. Mm -hmm. And this process of having your own life, but still connecting with another person. Yeah. We don't have the freedom to say that that's really how it's supposed to be because we're taught when, you know, two people come together, become one, but that doesn't mean that one means oneness of every single solitary level. That is absolutely right. You know, and it, it also comes with this, this idea that, um, again, that complete like-mindedness. I, I personally think that uh, road to only, will only lead to misery because it really doesn't exist. Except, now here's the irony, that kind of complete simpatico my experience is much more likely to be found within the context of friendship um, than it is in romantic relationships. Right. So part of the play is, again, in the margins, is this idea that these things you need, you can find them in other people. These things that, that a wife might expect from her husband emotionally, maybe even has a right to. Okay, right. but they aren't there. It doesn't mean you have to do without them. I think it would benefit a lot of us, you know, who, who maybe this hasn't occurred to, that you can find that need and it can be fulfilled outside of the context of marriage. Correct. You know, you, you can find that if you think to look for it. You can't think that, oh, my. You know, I don't think it's the best to think that your marriage is failing or your relationship is failing because um, you're not getting every single thing you need. Now, there are, of course, there are some non-negotiables you will have. Like, no, I, I need this from my partner. I need exactly. this from you. But these things that, you know, maybe aren't don't necessarily you just need to fulfill. You just don't necessarily need them for, fulfilled by your partner. Just go have, you know, find somebody you can connect with on that level. Right. But we're not taught that we're not. That's not that's considered taboo because you're supposed to then right. go back into this this huddle, this bubble of 
this me and this other person. But mm-hmm. reality of it is, is that you have, and I think that comes with maturity. It comes with maturity. I can't say for sure. Sh- I'm not going to say for sure. I know for a fact that's not how I came mm-hmm. into my marriage. Mm-hmm. But again, I came into it sort of in the to grow, mid, right. right, like the late late 30s. And so now again, I'm like, mm, no, that's not well, how. There's I- a line I wrote in the play where there, um, time in my play, in the original play, it is father time. Mm-hmm. It was the embodiment of time. In my play, it's a trio of of women who are, you know, uh, trios of um, goddess figures or mythological figures are very common. In Shakespeare, even there's the three witches and, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, But in, um, in those, in Joseph Campbell terms, whenever you see these uh, three incarnations of femininity, they're, they're actually the same incarnation Mm -hmm. of they are one person and three people. It's like the trilogy. Right. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, three and one. Right. But anytime, if it's the Furies, if it's the Grey Ladies, if it's, you know, any sort of Mother Maiden Crone trilogy, these are actually aspects of the same trilogy throughout time. Okay. And one of them asks Hermione, you know, oh, where you been, girl? In my play, they're hairdressers. Okay. I like, a, I like that. I like that. There's a joke there because all women know. A uh, hairdressers don't give a damn about your time. <laughs> they don't. They really don't because you're going to be there until they tell you you're done and so they get yes, you done. Yes. So, you know, I say, okay, let's make them hairdressers, you know, as a, as a bit of irony. Right. But um, um, one of them asked Hermione, oh, where you been? Blah, 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 blah. And um, she goes, well, you know what? I've been away. And one of them says, and because this is actually of my line because I really believe this when I'm saying I get it privacy that's the key to any successful marriage <laughs> yes privacy privacy you is key. privacy you'll be together forever <laughs> exactly you keep everybody else out your business you'll live you'll have a longer marriage than you would if you didn't and you know even privacy from one another yes. I think everyone whether it's um, a relationship a marriage um a friendship a time to miss each other is very important you know, you know, some time, you know, it doesn't have to be outright separate vacations, but, no. you know, but if, if you're fortunate enough to have a room or space that's just yours, yours, where you can, again, you can retreat to, not because necessarily you've been fighting or whatever, right. but just to have time to yourself for yourself. Right. And I it's healthy it's for any relationship. It's healthy. Um, I personally take personal, um, well, when life was open, <laughs> when life was open, I used to always, um, I started getting into the habit of doing solo trips. So I would find my husband and I, we have a lot of similarities, but then again, yeah. we have so many different things that we don't like. I like to be out in the sun. I mm-hmm. like to be out where I like to be where it's heat. So yeah. Yeah. him and I going to Arizona, even in the spring, it's still hot. Like it's 98, 99, 100 degrees, even in the spring. So for him and I to go there would be a vacation that would be um, met with a lot of complaints and a lot of murmuring and a lot of everything because I'm going to want to be outside. Right. He is. So I find that for me and our relationship, he does his own solo trip and I do my own. And we get to do those things because then I can, I can go when I want to, and I can mm-hmm. do the things that I like, and I can enjoy yeah, the yeah. things that make me, me without having to compromise it every single time. You know what I mean? And just having yeah. something that's exclusively mine. I get it. And I, I think it makes sense. Of course, Hermione's uh, separation from her husband is 16 years. Right. That's a lot um, of separation. Yeah. Um, <laughs> out of necessity. Mm-hmm. Um, um, to shelter herself from his horribleness. Right. But um, 16 years under not hideous circumstances might be, ex- you know, excessive. But-, That's excessive. <laughs> but again, if we would take smaller breaks, if we would take mm-hmm. smaller separations, like you said, the separateness of different in the house or a room, right. we don't right. think to do that. Because again, we're taught to be almost like a Velcro. But the thing about being a Velcro relationship, and I've and I've heard people say this about couples, Velcro couples. Yeah. If you're ever around a Velcro couple, you'll know that they argue, even in public places. They're very unhappy because yeah. not we're not made to sit underneath 
people anybody or seven anybody, anybody. And any like even my friends i love them but i need my space as well i need to Talk have to my, own, my own yeah. thing i don't need to be up underneath one person or a group of people in order for me to feel like i'm a part of this group or i'm a part of but this we're group. more inclined to understand that in the friendship context than we are in a relationship context you just assume right. that in a relationship context it means something's wrong it's like, right. well, you know, the, the person you're partnered with is also a person, like your friends are people. So, right. uh, you know, of course, the same sort of thing would apply. Yeah, very true. But again, yeah. <laughs> I think I really, like I said, if it wasn't for the maturity of growing into myself, and that's why I, if I could go back to the 20 year old toy, I would really be like, listen, you need time to grow. And so times like for me, and we go back to the church thought. Right. right. We're taught to couple. We're taught to be in an immediate couple them and that the only way of not the only way, but the biggest level of success is from a marriage mm -hmm. is from a couple them in, in a church context. Yeah, it's from that. And so I grew up underneath that. My church was heavily into that. And so being yeah, in a, lot people, of a lot of us are, you know, we're taught this process of being in this couple them and the only way to be successful is to have this, this marriage, this relationship. However, I find that again, parts of that, a lot of that, when it's not guided by the right premise can be very dangerous because you don't feel like you've been like, there's women. I've had a fallout with a friend who literally was screaming at the top of her lungs because she was mad that I was being married. I was getting married and she wasn't. And she was like, this is something that I wanted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we lose sight of this healthy mindset when we think that the only success we can have is through our last names changing. We do more for the last name change than we do for mm -hmm. ourselves. We do more for this glitz and glamour of this day than we even put into the actual marriage itself. So yeah, you know, come in with a lot of layers that really are really unhealthy. And then you have to unravel that. And a lot of times it doesn't get unraveled until something happens. Until yeah, yeah. To you knock the situation, the person off of this pedestal that we put them on. And then we start this process of self self discovery. Oh, oh. yeah. Um, in, in, in my mind, Hermione um, starts that journey immediately after uh, something um, happens. Uh, hugely tragic. I think my Leontes, um there are limitations with right. Zoom. With Zoom, if I, right. had staged, if I had staged this, um, it's it's funny. Listen, I don't know what it is about me, but in my playwriting, but I am still in my Tarantino phase when it comes to um, portraying right, violence on stage. <laughs> so Zoom really kept me in check in that regard. Right. Um, so there are some things that are only implied in this Zoom okay. version, but um, my Leontes is very uh, physically abusive. His son is very damaged. His wife is a trauma victim. Um, there's very little of that manifesting on screen, but if people listen, they, they, can, you know, they, they can kind of hear, you know, how this might have been on stage. I'm very pleased with the way it came out on Zoom, it really okay. does for, oh yeah, 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 this is not me saying, you know, oh, Zoom. Um, it's one of those things where it, is, it, it ends up expanding you creatively because you go, okay, well, this, this is the context under which we can do this. How do we do it? And you find a way. And it was amazing. Like Phoenix was like, you know, Seth and Jessica were so much help in that regard. I keep telling them, I keep saying this, I, every time like things would come up and they would go, oh no, we got it. You don't have to do that. I'm like, I don't have to do that. Right. I don't, I don't have to do that or that or that. And you'll do, it was amazing. I've never had so much help um, with the production. And I mean, knowledgeable help because right. I've never done anything on, on um, Zoom. I and think we're all that experience. And yeah. um, I, I don't know if I ever would have tackled it on Zoom had they not made me this offer, honestly, I, I, it would not have happened. And I'm glad that you had that support because listen, I mean, just with the setup with today, like it's, it's hard to navigate this new, it's not impossible, but it's hard. And again, you're having people that could say, I, I got you. 
Yeah. Like, oh, girl. Super helpful. Like it's super, it, it takes the edge off and you're able to do the creating and you can focus on that than having to do all the mechanical parts. Not, so when it comes to, I mean, I'm fairly proficient on computers. Okay. Right. But, you know, doing something like this in, in, again, this theater context on Zoom, lots of times with electronic stuff, if I don't know it, I will just hope there's somebody there and I can turn to go, uh, please make it go. Right. Please, please please this work go. In. You know? Right. And they were just able to make it go. <laughs> they were just able to make it go, for which I am ridiculously grateful. So three shows, yes. I believe I saw Friday night, which is the show that I'll be at. Um, Friday at seven mm -hmm. and then um, Saturday at seven again mm -hmm. and then Sunday almost like a little matinee show at two yes ma'am do you see any levels of maybe expanding it or even offering it after you show it to like maybe record it and kind of showing it afterwards anything's possible we'll see we'll see um we'll see what happens but I'm just very much looking for I hope I hope people enjoy it everyone has worked so hard right um from you know um um seth the ad and jessica and you know um helping to set up things like this and especially i want to give a special shout out Go ahead. <laughs> to um the person who created the slides because um she had to create um a lot of the slides on the fly okay because okay. there were certain things that i would just I would forget. I'm like, oh, we need a slide. And then she would, she would just create it, just create them. So God bless her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, every, I mean, everybody was great, but That's she, good. she's the one who mostly I was going, yeah, we're in the middle of rehearsal and I forgot this, this slide. Could you make it now? And then she would just make it. And listen, you need everybody, <laughs> somebody with the graphic technology whether they're using canva or they can just do it from whatever they're using we need everybody needs one of them on their team i have to virtually be everything on one team because i'm a one team person but yeah everybody needs one of those on every team yes, yes. So thank you thank you thank you so much lydia thank you lydia thank you lydia uh, so what for putting up with my my um for thinking for me thank you for thinking for me lydia <laughs> yeah forward thinking you need someone on your team that can forward thinking mm -hmm. Because it all brings it all together. Mm -hmm. Well, I personally, like I said, I um, have cleared out my little calendar and I cannot right. wait Friday at seven. And I just want everyone that's listening, because I'm going to put this uh, post this today, that I want everybody to just come out and flood the support, show the love. I mean, I love the way we broke this down today because it's able to give people just a little bit more of a background and to show like a lot of times people think that Shakespeare is really hard because of the language barrier or yeah. the wordage, I should say. But a lot of the things are so um, appropriate no matter when ever they're being shown. Like it doesn't matter what year they're being shown. There's yeah, okay. universal. An eternal it's universal message. So mm -hmm. I'm hoping that everyone that's listening will be able to really come out and support and, and, and view it and just show that love back. Cause Philadelphia um, arts is really uh, dear to me. I've been following a lot of the circuits and I, yeah. I'm always about supporting always. Thank we, you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming to um, our opening show. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. So I will do a, um, a blog about it, a review afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. This will be, I'll have this come out in a couple hours after I edit, but I just, I'm so grateful for your time today. I can't thank you enough. This oh, is thank an you. amazing conversation. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a delight. Absolutely. So I'll see you and everything go down Friday. Okay. All, All right, right, girl. Till then. Till then. Bye. Bye. So what did you think? Wasn't that interview absolutely amazing? Let me tell you something about Shakespeare. When you say that Shakespeare is so outdated and the conversation and the wording and the language is outdated, the themes are universal. They do not change. What's been happening back then is the same things that are happening right now. There's nothing, absolutely nothing new under the sun. So with that being said, I hope that you get your tickets. I'm going to leave the link inside of the notes for this show. Make sure that you get this. Make sure you support this. We're all home, right? 
So we have a little bit of time. So make sure you get to that Friday show. Can't make it Friday. Get to that Saturday show. Can't get to a Saturday. Get yourself on a little bit of a matinee at two o'clock on Sunday. Get in there. Relax. Enjoy. Grab the today is what? Nat, National Drink Wine Day. So pour yourself a glass. Order your tickets ahead of time right now. Go ahead and support. Listen, we have got to support Philadelphia theater and theater just in general. A lot of companies like Phoenix uh, Theater Company is pivoting. They're learning to find a way to bring entertainment and and understanding to our screens. And that's a lot of hard work, right? There's a lot of work that goes along with that. So I want us to do our very best to support. So I want you to go ahead, get your tickets, get them now. Look at the uh, our, the notes for the show. Get them. The link is right there. I made it super easy for you. Get the show. I'm going to be at the Friday show at 7 p.m. If you haven't already heard, I said it a couple of times. I'll be there at the seven o'clock show on Friday. I will also be doing a blog to hit Saturday morning. So then in case you're like wondering even further after this conversation and now be visually seeing it, I'll have a nice little review of it for Saturday morning. I want you to get your tickets. Let's support. Thank you, Miss Katrina and the entire staff of Phoenix Theater for allowing me to one interview and as, as always allowing me to help to support the theater and arts here in Philadelphia, which has been extremely, extremely amazing. So I want you guys to have a good weekend. Yes, I'll still have my regular episode tomorrow for Friday, but I still wanted us to make sure that we got this today. So let's all support. Thank you as always for joining me. And I know that even in the deepest or joyful conversations, that there's something we can learn and apply. Until next time, I hope that you are doing better. If not, we will be back to talk some more and handle it. Peace to you and yours. Stay grounded.